This is the second fraction video, and in this video I'll be covering how to add and subtract fractions. So let's first look at the steps. So I have four steps here. I'm going to read through them or go through them fairly quickly. They might not make much sense now, but when I work through a couple examples, I'll keep referring back to the steps and hopefully it all fits together. So the first thing that we want to do in adding and subtracting fractions is we want to factor the denominator. Now this is different than all of the other factoring techniques that we've done so far, like reducing, multiplying, and dividing, because those have you factor every part of every fraction. Here, we only want to factor the denominator. If you can factor the numerators, that doesn't help you one way or another. So just leave the numerators as is. Now when you factor the denominators, you want to make sure to pick out the largest common factor. If you don't pick out the largest common factor, then you're actually doing more work in the long run. So make sure you pick out the largest factor. Now, at first glance, if you can't pick out what the largest common factor is between the denominators, then you may need to factor your denominators all the way down to prime factorization and pick out all the prime factors that they have in common. Now, this may seem confusing now, but I'll actually be doing an example using this method, so hopefully you can understand what I'm talking about. Once you've done that, you should be able to pick out what factors the denominators have in common and what factors the denominators don't have in common. So if you multiply the opposite fractions by the missing pieces, then that overall will give you your least common denominator, and that is the absolute most important step in adding and subtracting fractions. So if you don't pick out the largest common factor here, then that does not give you the least common denominator there. And again, that's more work for yourself in the long run. So after you get both fractions into least common denominator form, then you can finally do what you were set out to do and to put your two fractions together. And you do that by adding and subtracting the numerator of the fractions and putting those over your least common denominator, which you work so hard to get. At that point, you finally put your two fractions together into one fraction. So you're almost done with the problem. And the very last step that you see is reduce which you should be used to by now. So let's go ahead and see an example on this problem. So the first example that I have here is 9 over 20 minus 11 over 28. So the first thing that we want to do is factor the denominators and pick out the largest common factor that's in common between these two denominators. So if you start this, you might notice that they're both even and so that they both have a common factor of 2. Now that's a great start, but that's not the largest common factor, which I said was so important to get from the beginning. So we need to pick out the largest common factor from these, and the largest common factor that goes into both 20 and 28 is actually 4. So I'm going to write 20 as 4 times 5, and I'm going to write 28 as 4 times 7. To confirm that that's the largest common factor, I'm going to look at the other pieces that I didn't pick out in common, which are 5 and 7. And I want to double check that those two factors don't have anything in common. And of course they don't because they're prime. So I'm going to rewrite these fractions as 9 over 4 times 5 minus 11 over 4 times 7. And Again, this might be different than what you've seen it to be done in the past, but this is going to help us with other fraction techniques that you're going to use in the future and which you are not going to be able to use your calculator for. So we have done step number one, and we've done it without needing to use prime factorization. Okay, step number two, we need to multiply the opposite fractions by the missing pieces. Now, I have an analogy that goes with this, which hopefully will help you remember the technique of this. It may seem a little unusual at first, but I guarantee it will help you remember this technique later on. I like to think of these two fractions that I have here. This is my first fraction and this is my second fraction. I like to think of these two fractions as two kids in the candy store. 
And when these two kids leave the candy store, they need to have the exact same pieces of candy in their candy baskets. Otherwise, you're going to have some jealous kids, and that's going to cause the major fight. So we need to make sure that the candy baskets, a.k.a. the denominator, match exactly so we don't have any jealous kids or upset fractions at the end of this problem. So if we compare these two candy baskets right now, both of them have a piece of four candy, which is awesome because that means they match. But if we look a little bit farther, the left fraction has a piece of five candy, which my right fraction doesn't. And my right fraction has a piece of seven candy, which my left fraction doesn't. So if I had two kids leave with this in their candy baskets, I'd have some fighting to be dealing with, and that's not something I want to do. So what I want to do is I want to make sure all the fractions or all the kids in the candy store have the same pieces of candy at the end of the problem. So since my right fraction has a seven piece of candy, I'm going to give that to my left fraction or my left kid in the candy store. Now, not only am I going to do that in the denominator, but I'm also going to do that in the numerator as well. And I'll explain why I have to do that here in a minute. My left kid has a piece of five candy, so I need to give that piece of five candy to my right fraction. So now when I compare my two candy baskets, I have a seven piece of candy, a four piece of candy, and a five piece of candy with my left kid's candy basket. And I have the same pieces of candy in my right kid's candy basket. So at this point, I wouldn't have fighting over any candy. So this means that my fractions are good to go, and this means that you've coincidentally actually found your common denominator. If I multiply all of these numbers out, that's going to give me my least common denominator. So let's multiply them out. 7 times 4 times 5 gives me 140. And since those match in both fractions, that means both of my fractions have the exact same number or my least common denominator. Okay. Not only do I need to multiply the denominators out, but I also need to multiply my numerators out. So let's do that as well. And don't forget, you multiply fractions by multiplying them straight across. So on the top here of my left fraction, 7 times 9 gives me 63. And on my right fraction, 11 times 5 gives me 55. So I have finished step number two. I've multiplied by my missing pieces, and I found my LCD in this problem, which works out to be 140. So going back to what I talked about before, not only did I have to put my piece of seven candy in the bottom, but I also had to put it in the top as well. And same thing over here. Fives had to go both in the numerator and the denominator. The reason that we have to do that is because you can manipulate these fractions but you cannot actually change their numerical value. So if I take this fraction here, 63 over 140, that needs to be exactly the same as what I started out with, is 9 over 20. Now, they don't look exactly the same, but if I were to divide them out, or if I were to reduce my left fraction, it should reduce exactly as the same as my right fraction here. And if I didn't do it in both the numerator and the denominator, then these two would not be equivalent value, and that would be no good. Same thing with my other fraction, 55 over 140. That needs to be exactly the same as 11 over 28. So if I were to reduce it, it would become out the same, or if I were to divide it out and find the numerical value, they should be exactly the same. So that's why we have to put them in the numerator and in the denominator at the same time. All right, now I'm on to step number three, which means I actually get to put these fractions together. And I do that by just doing what the numerators tell me to do. So in this case, I take 63 minus 55. And 63 minus 55 gives me 8. And I put it over the denominator that we worked so hard to get, which is 140. Okay. So I finished step number 3. And last but not least, you always need to check and make sure that you cannot reduce. Now I see that both of these are even, so I know that I can re reduce both of them by 2. But actually, I can reduce both of them by a larger number, 
four goes into both of them evenly. So eight, I'm gonna write as four times two. 140, I'm gonna write as four times 35. I can cancel out those identical factors, and that leaves me with my final answer, which is two over 35. All right, so let's move on to my second example. This example is 19 over 60 minus five over 84. Now this is a more difficult example. And again, the first step is to factor the denominator to figure out what's the largest common factor that they have. Now, if you can do that at first glance, that's awesome. And I suggest that you pause the video and finish this problem on your own. If you can't, then that's a time where maybe we need to utilize this prime factorization. So I'm gonna take each of these denominators and I'm going to break them down as far as I possibly can. Hence, finding the prime factorization of each of these numbers. So I'm gonna take 60 and I'm gonna break it down. Now you can break it down into any two factors, it's all gonna work out the same. So I'm just gonna start with six times 10. Okay. All right, now neither one of these are prime, so I'm going to keep breaking them down until I can't anymore. Six I can write as two times three, and 10 I can write as two times five. Now at this point, I'm only left with prime numbers, so that means I cannot break down 60 any farther. So this is my prime factorization. I need to do the same thing with 84. I suggest you pause the video and see if you can do this on your own. Okay. So 84, um, I don't pick out any large factors that they have in common right away. So I'm just gonna do it by two because I know that it's even. So this is two times 42, keep going down. 42 is two times 21. And 21, I can break down as three times seven. So if I take the ends of all of these trees here, that gives me 84 is two times two times three times seven. That is its prime factorization. So with these prime factorizations that I have seen here, this one that goes with 60 and this one that goes with 84, I wanna pick out all the factors they have in common, just like the kids in the candy store. So I see a two here, I see a two here, and that's great. I see a second two here and I see a second two here, and again, that's awesome. Now make sure that not only do they have the same pieces of candy, but they have the same quantities of pieces of candy. So they both need two pieces of two candy, if that makes any sense. Also, I noticed that they have a three in common. So those are the factors that they have in common. And then I can see the factors that they don't have in common, which is a five and a seven. So I have basically just picked out my largest common factor. If I multiply all of these red circles together, that gives me my largest common factor. So two times three gives me six, six times two gives me 12. So this problem gives me a 12 times five. That's the way I'm gonna write 60 out into its factorization. Same thing with 84, if I multiply all the red numbers out, four times three it also gives me 12, which of course it should, and then times a the leftover piece, which is 12 times seven. So I'm gonna write 84 as 12 times seven. So my largest common factor is 12. At this point, you should be able to finish this problem on your own, so I suggest that you pause the video and go from there. At this time, I need to multiply my fractions by their missing pieces, so I don't have any jealous kids in the candy store. So I'm gonna multiply this fraction by seven over seven, and I'm gonna multiply this fraction by five over five. Therefore, their denominators, or their candy baskets, are all identical. So I need to do all this multiplication out. So seven times 19 gives me 133. 7 times 12 times 5 in the denominator gives me 420. Minus 5 times 5, or 25. Over again, these are all exactly the same, so this is 420. So I have found my least common denominator. And in this problem, my LCD worked out to be 420. 
Since you have your denominators matching, now you can do what the numerators tell you to do. So in this case, it's 133 minus 25, and when I subtract those, I get 108 over my LCD of 420. So I'm on to my last step, which says I need to reduce. Now I need to pick out the largest common factor that goes into 108 and 420. If you don't know the largest one offhand, then just pick the ones that you notice in common. So maybe you just need to start with two because they're both even, and that's perfectly fine. I actually do know the largest common factor, and it's 12, which is coincidence that our common factor back here is 12. It doesn't always work out that way, so I definitely wouldn't expect it to work out that way. So 108, I can write as 12 times 9. And 420, I can write as 12 times 35. So once I cancel out these 12s, that gives me my final answer of 9 over 35. So I've worked through a couple of examples of how to add and subtract fractions. And as you can see, the most important concept is you need to have a least common denominator first and once you do that, then you can work the problem just like it looks like you should.